I mean, not here on, <laughs> on, on Zoom, but if you have not visited the new facility, you really should um, make an take an opportunity to go and take a look at it. It's really very beautiful. But for those people who don't really know what the center is about, it's a wonderful resource to our community and it's got programs focused on holistic well wellness for all individuals who are 55 years of age or older. And there are many benefits to participating in the programs, not the least of which is developing rewarding relationships with others. That's the best one. You also get to maintain and retain your physical fitness and you learn a lot, which is part of what this program is about. But mostly when you come to the center, you just have plain fun. We've always valued diversity, but since August of 2017, we've been extra carefully examining our internal practices to identify the ways that we may have contributed to the problems in our community. From these self-assessments, we're working toward ways that we can demonstrate our intent to make the center a warm, welcoming place for anybody who wants to come there. The Diversity and Inclusion Committee of which I'm a member, as you heard, has designed this speaker series to help people get to know and understand each other better. And we want to be able to participate in healthy dialogue about race in a very safe space. So this is it. As a community-owned resource, we believe it's our responsibility to help reduce the divide in our community and to do whatever is necessary to help heal the open wounds that exist here. I don't need to tell you that racism is pretty ugly or that it can impact anyone, everyone, no matter what your skin color is. Our speaker this evening, Lisa Drain, experienced firsthand what racism looks like, how truly ugly it can become. When her daughter was one of the 19 individuals seriously injured by the car that killed Heather Heyer in August 2017. That violence that erupted on that day resulted in the uncovering of a myriad of wrongs in our sweet little town, once listed as one of the top 10 places to retire. Lisa is a freelance producer and local community activist here in Charlottesville. Her past projects include Seeing Black, Disrupting the Visual Narrative, which is a speaker and youth engagement series featuring local Black photographers for the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. She was also the originator of Inside Out Seville, an outdoor exhibition of 120 large-scale black and white portraits of racial justice activists that many of you may have seen on the wall of the Violet Crown Theater, and she'll be sharing some of those with you this evening. Ms. Drain served as the festival manager for the Look 3 Festival of the Photograph from 2007 to 2017. But before moving to Charlottesville in 2000, she was the news producer in the Washington Bureau of TF1, French television, the leading national network in France. Lisa has two daughters, Rebecca and Sophie, whom she adores, and she really feels very proud of them because they, like her, are trying to make a difference in the world. Lisa's going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then she's going to be joined by three community activists whom she will introduce I know that most of them, all of them need no introduction. So right at this moment, let's just say hello and welcome to Lisa Drain and her friends. Thanks so much, Enid. I really am honored that you and Virginia Porter invited me to participate in the speaker series. So what does a mother do with the grief, guilt, and rage? Sometimes there's a moment in one's life that splits everything into before and after. August 12th, 2017 was that moment for me. Even though I grew up in South Carolina, as steeped in post-Jim Crow racism and lost cause mythology as sweet tea, I'd only heard or read about white supremacists and the Ku Klux Klan. But in 2017, Charlottesville's summer started with both. In July, I stood in disbelief when actual Klansmen, hoods and all, paraded around the Stonewall Jackson statue on the grounds of the courthouse. By the time we got to August, the summer of hate was in full bloom. While city and university officials told us to ignore the upcoming Unite the Right rally and stay home, I decided I needed to be in the streets. Both of my daughters, Rebecca and Sophie, felt the same. We assumed it would be safer for three white women to stand up to the alt-right protesters and the police, if need be, than it would be for African Americans and other people of color. Of course, many assumptions about that weekend turned out to be wrong. 
On the evening of August 11th, Rebecca and I attended the multi-faith service at St. Paul's. When we were able to leave this church, we noticed what looked like a line of fire in front of the rotunda, and we headed in that direction. Unbeknownst to us, Sophie, who at the time was a rising fourth year student at UVA, was with friends and they were alerted to the presence of rally goers on grounds. This group of about 25 students and community members surrounded the Jefferson statue just in front of the rotunda in an attempt to hold the space, to hold the space and prevent these people from overtaking the rotunda and UVA. And you know, you've seen those images on television now. That small group was then surrounded by 300 neo-Nazis waving torches and screaming in their faces, Jews will not replace us, white lives matter, and other hateful rhetoric. Sophie told me later that she wasn't sure how she and her friends were gonna get out of there alive. Looking back, I'm not sure why we weren't deterred by that evening's horror show. But the next morning, we were more determined than ever that we needed to show these white right-wing extremists that they were not welcome in our town. You've seen the frightening images, but I can tell you it was much worse in person. The air was thick with some kind of chemical agent. I was coughing, my eyes were stinging. We all pulled up our shirts and bandanas over to cover our mouths. I linked arms with my daughters and attempted to block the rally goers from entering the park. But unarmed young people with noisemakers were no match for guys with helmets, shields, bats, and guns. They broke right through our line, shoving us aside. Water bottles, rocks, other things were flying through the air. And then fights between rally goers and counter protesters broke out. It was mayhem. And unbelievably, I looked up and dozens of police officers equipped in riot gear with a tank were standing by doing nothing. Then minutes before the 12 p.m. rally was actually supposed to begin, the police declared a state of emergency and dispersed the crowd. It seemed as though things were over. We felt, well, at least we prevented the rally from happening. I was hot and tired and decided to go home. My girls chose to stay. But not 30 minutes after I walked in the door, a friend called and said, you've got to get back down here. Sophie's been hit by a car. The real nightmare had begun. What does a mother do with the grief, the guilt, and the rage? Imagine arriving at the hospital, finding one of your daughters outside, distraught, unable to tell you what had happened to her sister, and then being told you can't enter the emergency room because the hospital was on lockdown due to a mass casualty situation. No idea what that even meant. As a parent, imagine sitting in the hospital waiting room for four hours, unable to be with your injured daughter, and then looking up on the television in the waiting room and seeing CNN replaying footage of a car driving into a crowd and only then realizing that your daughter was one of the victims of an intentional car attack, not a random car accident. When she was released, we were told she had had a concussion, multiple lacerations, including one on her forehead that required numerous stitches and a badly broken leg. Her leg was too swollen to determine if surgery would be required. That night, while helping her get ready for bed, I saw that her body was covered in bruises, cuts, and scrapes, indicating just how badly she was battered when the car hit her and she then hit the, the road. I felt like I was going to be sick. Ten days later, when Sophie should have been starting her fourth year at UVA, she was in the hospital undergoing major reconstructive surgery on her leg. She would leave three days later with a permanent metal plate, multiple screws, and cadaver tendons in place of the ruptured ligaments around her knee. There would be no moving into her apartment or joining her classmates on grounds. Walking again would take months of physical therapy. 
the emotional and physical scars of both daughters would be long and deep. Those of you who are parents know that when your child is suffering, you're also suffering. In that first year, I kept asking myself, why had I gone home? Why wasn't I there to protect my child? And who was to blame? City officials who didn't listen to the warnings we were giving them? The police who didn't protect us? An underground white supremacist culture that let far right ideology fester, especially in the minds of impressionable young white men? Or should I blame Donald Trump for normalizing that culture? And like salt being poured into the wounds, I would continue to feel the pain every time I saw hashtag Charlottesville played and replayed in the media, or when I sat in the Paramount Theater and watched the documentary, Our Streets, or when I saw the films Fahrenheit 11-9 and Black Klansman, both of which included footage of the car attack that showed dozens of community members, including Sophie, being hit by the car and tossed into the air like rag dolls. Then there were the multiple days of legal proceedings where the perpetrator of this domestic terrorist act sat just a few feet away from me in a courtroom. But most heartbreaking of all was seeing both of my daughters stand up in a federal courthouse to give victim impact statements. What does a mother do with the grief, guilt, and rage. What would you do in my position? I kept hearing that while most people in the white community were shocked by what had happened on August 11th and 12th, those in the black community were not surprised at all. Why was that? I started paying more attention to what black leaders were saying. People like Andrea Douglas, Jelaine Schmidt, Don Gathers, Tanisha Hudson and Zayana Bryant. I learned more about the racial history of Charlottesville. I tried to really hear what it meant and means to be a person of color here. It slowly dawned on me that many members of our community had a very different experience of life in Charlottesville. Of course, it should have been obvious, but I realized my views were being filtered through my own whiteness. I wanted things to go back to normal but on so many levels, there would be no going back, no more living in that white bubble. So in July, 2018, about a year later, when I was feeling particularly down, I had the opportunity to join the Charlottesville Civil Rights Pilgrimage and assisted with the travel logistics. It was planned by Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Douglas. It was a once in a lifetime experience, as Enid and Virginia can tell you. While visiting iconic civil rights sites in cities across the South, for six days we were on two buses going all the way down to Alabama, I learned more about our country's shameful racist past. But I guess the most moving experience of the trip was going to the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama where we delivered a jar of soil from the lynching site of John Henry James, who was shot and hanged in 1898 near Farmington. That collection of soil will join the hundreds of others in the EJI Legacy Museum. And you can see one, a, a duplicate jar of that at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. We visited also the Memorial to Peace and Justice, also known as the Lynching Memorial where we saw the visual representation, these large coffin-like structures hanging down, representing over 4,000 documented cases of lynchings. We were fortunate Brian Stevenson took the time to speak to our group. And I, and I remember one thing he told us was that our country hasn't reconciled with our past. And if we had done so, if our ancestors had done so, August 12th never would have happened. It was clear to me at that time that the car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured Sophie and dozens of others 
was one more incident in a long line of racial terrorism stretching from slavery till today that white people have inflicted upon black, indigenous, and other people of color. After that trip, I started questioning everything. The trouble is, once you learn these uncomfortable truths, you really can't unlearn them. I was certainly well on my way to becoming that woke white woman, but that enlightenment wasn't benefiting anyone but me. Perhaps most of you or many of you have felt this way recently when seeing how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected black and brown communities. And in the wake of this summer's uprisings following the murder of George, George Floyd, you have a new awareness about the unequal and often brutal relationship that black people have with the police and with many other systems in our country, but you don't know what to do about it. And the problems just seem too overwhelming. Well, you've come to the right place. <laughs> I do have a few suggestions for you that I've learned in the last few years. You need to get educated. We can't affect the future unless we know our past. I've read a number of the books that you've heard about, Waking Up White, Just Mercy, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I'd recommend all of them. I've tried to attend every event I can at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, and I would urge you to do the same. Try to sit in on city council meetings. You learn a lot about what happens in the city there. And if you can, show up in person in solidarity with our black, brown, and indigenous neighbors. Just in the last few months, I've joined demonstrations in support of issuing driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants, in favor of taking down the Clark statue and establishing an indigenous cultural center at UVA. And of course, in the wake of George Floyd's murder in support of black lives. And I've learned all of these causes are connected. You can also make a difference by supporting minority-owned minority -owned businesses and contributing to or volunteering for organizations that work to combat di the disparities in our community. I encourage you to get involved if, with politics, whether it's supporting progressive candidates like Cameron Webb or working to change racist policies and laws, especially on the local and state levels where you really can make a difference. I can give you an example of that um, in the Monumental Justice Campaign. So on August 12, 2017, the Unite the Right rally was convened ostensibly to protest the proposed removal of the Robert E. Lee statue. I tell you, before the summer of hate, I must confess, I had not paid much attention to those Confederate statues. They were everywhere in my hometown of Columbia, South Carolina, just part of the landscape. But what I hadn't thought about was how these symbols of a war fought to maintain the institution of slavery were viewed by descendants of enslaved people. What I learned on Dr. Douglas's and Dr. Schmidt's monument tour was that when these statues were installed in the early 1900s, at the height of the Jim Crow era, they were meant to intimidate Black Americans and further exclude them from our public spaces. These statues were doing the work of white supremacists then and now. On August 12, 2017, that Lee statue was not a benign art object, but a magnet that attracted hundreds of people who wanted to assert that being white was enough to claim superiority and that black Americans, indigenous Americans, other people of color, Jews, Muslims, immigrants, LGBTQI people were less than and don't belong in this country. On August 12, 2017, these un-American beliefs led to violence, injury, death, and deep trauma for our community, both for those who witnessed the tragedy, as I did and many others, and those who only saw the images on television. But by 2019, two years after Unite the Right, many of us were frustrated that 
these Confederate statues still stood. So a group of ordinary citizens from around the state, led by Jelaine Schmidt, Kristen Zekos, Frank, and Frank Dukes, started the Monumental Justice Campaign. We took our fight to the State House in support of Delegate Sally Hudson's proposed legislation that would give localities the right to decide what to do with their Confederate monuments. In January, two busloads of us traveled to Richmond for a rally on the steps of the State House Capitol. And over the course of the next eight weeks, we made our voices heard. And probably many of you joined us. We attended and spoke at hearings. We called, wrote, and lobbied state legislators. And in the end, unbelievably, we won. The law passed in April and went into effect on July 1st. And just this past Saturday, the Albemarle Board of Supervisors was the first in our state to remove a statue under the new law. The Johnny Reb at Ready statue that stood in front of the county courthouse for 111 years came down. It was an incredible moment. But as Zayana Bryant reminded us when Johnny Reb was coming down off his pedestal, the removal of that statue was merely symbolic. If these actions, if actions don't lead to bigger changes in policies that have resulted in opportunity gaps for many of our citizens. So it's true, my life will never go back to where I was before August 12th. But I can now see that some good has come from this tragedy. When I finally sought help from a therapist, she told me that I certainly had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but that I also had the possibility in time of having PTG, post-traumatic growth. I'd like to think I'm on my way to that growth. We can't wait for another tragedy to happen to be moved to action. Issues of racial justice aren't someone else's problem. We're connected. So whether you're at the barricades or at your computer, you too can be a race, an anti-racist activist working to dismantle the entrenched systems that have perpetuated inequality, anti-Semitism, white supremacy. I'd like to invite you to join me on this journey, to turn our community into a place where everyone, not just the few, have the opportunity to thrive. It's not gonna be easy, but with courage, we can do it. I know we can. Thank you. So Carolyn, I wanted, thanks, thanks you guys. Um, I wanted to ask you if you would put up a couple of photos. Um, I wanted to show you just a few photos from the, the Johnny Reb takedown. If in case you weren't there or didn't happen to see it, there were just leave you with some signs of hope. Um, we hope that, uh, and you can go through the, there's two or three of them. Uh, we hope that the Lee and Jackson statues are gonna come down soon. Thanks. There he was getting ready. He was, he was put in the back of a pickup truck and covered with packing blankets and then drove off along with his cannons and uh, cannonballs. Um, so now I wanted to tell you about um, another project that, um, that I worked on with a group of, of folks um, last summer. Um, we, um, we did this project as part of the Unity Days events um, that happened in commemoration of the second anniversary of um, August 12th. Um, I wanted to tell a different story on the second anniversary one that wasn't gonna be showing Charlottesville as a tragedy, but more as a place where there are hundreds of people of all races, backgrounds, um, who are working for social and racial justice on all fronts every day. And so um, I asked two lovely local photographers, Eze Amos and Kristen Finn, to take portraits of 120 of these activists. And we certainly didn't get everybody, um, but these folks were just some of the people that 
we wanted to highlight and just show you how many people are really working, working hard behind the scenes. So I have just a few, um, Carolyn, you can flip through the uh, four or five shots. There's Don Gathers in front of his own portrait. You can keep going. Katrina Turner, Ange Khan. Seth Wispelway with his daughter, Corey Long. And now that brings us to um, Chantel Bingham. So uh, the next three people that I wanted to introduce you to were part of that project. Um, they were three of the leaders that um, we celebrated on the wall. And um, I just wanted to introduce you to them now um, because, you know, you don't need to hear me anymore, but um, I really want you to hear from three of the people who are doing a lot of this work on the ground and have made quite a difference in our community. Um, so Chantel Bingham um, is the program director for the Food Justice Network at Cultivate Charlottesville. And I've asked um, Chantel and Tamara and Harold just to tell you, oh, you can wait on that, Carolyn. Um, go back to Chantel, just to tell you a little bit about the work that they do and how they got there, how they, you know, how they ended up doing the work and um, how the particular work that they're all doing um, um, is working towards anti-racist activism, especially in today's climate. So I'll turn it over to Chantel. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to start out with just telling you, if you don't know it already, that um, you're an amazing woman, a phenomenal okay. woman. Don't you're make me cry, Chantel. I'm not going to make you cry, but I think you need to know that. And I am um, constantly amazed by you. And so thank you for, you know, sharing your space today. This is your time and you made the decision um, to design this panel in the way that we're doing it today. So I, I just wanted to, to take a little bit of time to tell you thank you for that. Um, so as Lisa has shared, I am the program director of the Food Justice Network at Cultivate Charlottesville. And for those of you who do not know, Cultivate Charlottesville is this amazing organization. We just relaunched um, in April 22nd of this, of this year. And really these are organizations that have been around in Charlottesville doing this work for a long time. City Schoolyard Garden, uh, who you may already know about, we operate gardens in all of Charlottesville City Schools. Um, and do a lot of hands-on experiential learning with youth. And then the Urban Agricultural Collective of Charlottesville, which is started in 2017 or 2007 by Karen Waters Wicks and QCC, um, this QCC board of residents, uh, launched and is still operating as our hub in our communities, really led by people of color, specifically low wealth communities in Charlottesville. And um, we operate urban farms um, in Friendship Court, South First Street, Sixth Street. Um, and, and it's just been amazing to be a part of, of that program. And then obviously the Food Justice Network, which I'm the program director of, uh, which is, came together in 2015 as this way to take a systemic approach, uh, a citywide approach to policy and advocacy around our food system. Um, and really tackling racial inequities that have always existed and have always been there. Um, I got to this work, I'm originally from uh, North Carolina. I was born in Goldsboro. I'm the great granddaughter of tobacco sharecroppers. And uh, I just wanna take some time to bring my ancestors into this space, uh, specifically Melissa Baker Best, my great, great grandmother and Raymond Best. Um, who was, Raymond was a, a really amazing carpenter. And actually there's a lot of tobacco drying sheds in Goldsboro um, that were made by his hands. When the Ku Klux Klan burned down our family's church uh, in the 1900s, he rebuilt it um, brick by brick and did not pass into our ancestors world until it was done. Other people, that led me to this work specific to Charlottesville is a late Holly Edwards, uh, as well as Joy Johnson, Karen Waters Wicks, and Tammy Wright. Uh, these women are people that I found early on. I made my way to Charlottesville through the University of Virginia as a student. 
And um, for me, it's been really important always to figure out a home. And my home was ironically with other black women and um, old elders really, and then also people in my age group, but mostly elders that have been doing this work in Charlottesville uh, decades before I arrived. And um, for decades, definitely beyond maybe if I ever leave, God forbid, but they've been here for a really long time. And um, those black women really introduced me to things, specifically Holly Edwards, Joy, Tammy, and Karen were always caring about our health um, and health inequities and how to really solve that. And so the question around, uh, I'm trying to keep this short, but the question around racial reckoning um, in our food system and things that we've, we've always known, I've definitely always known as a person that has family in, in tobacco sharecropping and before that, um, you know, the descendants of slaves in, in, in our America is that our, this institution that was created to feed our nation uh, was founded upon ideals uh, of a racial and gender-based social hierarchy, right? And, and those ideals really determine more than a human life. It determined the value of our labor. Uh, it, it, it determined homes for people. It determined access to education or even the freedom to, to just have a whole family, a mother, a father, children in one roof. And um, that whole system that, that we've created in the past, and I would argue that we still live very well, is flourishing in our present day, and it will continue to be our future if we do not make a, an active stance as one. Um, it's something that's really alive and well, it's thriving and talking about our food system, um, which is fraught with injustice. We know this with the numbers and um, that could be for, for many of us, that's 98% of our farmland is owned and operated by white, white people and 2% is, is owned by, by people of color. And if we're talking about um, food at the table and, and our ability to get it there, we know that hunger is something that affects all Americans, there's no doubt at all that we all struggle with that. Um, but it's also important to understand that where one in 10 white Americans face hunger and food insecurity, that number is, is twice as much for black Americans, so one in five. Um, and that, that was actually my childhood growing up as well. So one of six, single parent household. And one of the best things I remember about my mom is when it was dinner time. And I also knew the struggle it was to put that food on the table. Um, and so that's kind of where I come from. Um, I'm excited to be here today to discuss some things with you all around that. And this, this idea of racial reckoning, it can be a point of tension and pain. Um, my people have definitely felt that for a really long time, but it can also be a point of innovation um, and resilience. And, and thriving. And so I just, I just want to put that out there. There's so much in this smile. I think people always talk about my smile. And um, I just want folks to know that it doesn't have to be our end all be all, right? And we're here to, to do this work together. So that's all I have to say. I think, um, I, yeah, I'm gonna pass the baton. <laughs> Camera. Camera, okay. Sorry, I didn't know. Hey. Who was Thank you so much, Chantel. You, can, you guys can see why I am. Anyway, um, so that was fantastic. Um, I wanted, Carolyn, you could put up Tamara's um, photo. Um, so Tamara, are you on? I can't, she's here, right? Yes. Yep, I'm here. Next photo, Carolyn. Yep, working on it, sorry. Sorry. Um, so, like I said, Tamara was uh, also on the Violet Crown Wall as part of the Inside Out project. Um, and she is the executive director of the African American Teaching Fellows. Um, so, I asked her to, to join us to tell us about her work, how she got into it, and um, why it's particularly important in this time. Tamara? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I echo um, Chantel in saying thank you. Um, I think that she and I can definitely relate that at times when 
conversations are had in both of our areas, I would say, of expertise, we are not always people who are welcome to the table. Um, and so for you to have this opportunity and to say, um, I could speak or I could share, but I really feel like illuminating some other voices, um, it means a lot. Um, it means a lot to me. Um, and thank you for choosing to share someone else's voice when you had the opportunity. Doesn't always happen, so I appreciate you for that. Um, so I am, as she shared, the executive director of the African American Teaching Fellows. And typically when I share about AATF, I, I could ramble statistics to you. I could tell you that when you walk into any school in this community on any given day, it is not unusual that you will see only one black teacher in that building. It is not unusual that you may see none in the building, um, but you may see a student population of well over 30 to 40% African-American students in that building. And I could tell you about all the fellows that we've helped, the over 50 African-American college students that we have brought through college to full teacher licensure who have gone on to teach in the Charlottesville community. Um, and then I could tell you about the thousands of students whose lives have been changed in this community by having a Black teacher. But what I think is more impactful is that I share kind of this space that I never saw myself in, which was the field of education. Um, teaching was never in my plan. In fact, in high school, when someone asked me, what do you want to be? What do you want to study in college? I said, whatever, as long as I don't become a teacher, because everybody in my family works in education and I want to be as far away from it as possible. <laughs> so it is extremely ironic that I would not only find myself having completed six years as a classroom teacher in the local schools and that I am now the executive director of a nonprofit that works with both um, Albemarle County and Charlottesville City. But even within that, um, I can ultimately say that I am who I am because of a Black teacher. And any success that I have achieved, any accomplishment that I have is because of the first Black teacher that I've ever had, and that was my mother. Um, my mother, Dr. Pamela Wilkerson, who became the first person in our family to earn a doctorate degree um, from Virginia State University, is a veteran educator with near, nearly 30 years of experience in the school counseling sector in the public schools from Richmond to Dinwiddie County. And one of the things that she has taught me through simply living and serving is that anything that we learn, anything that we have is ours to share and to impact the life of someone else. And so for the first 12 years of my life that I can remember, um, I watched my mother work tirelessly to go above and beyond for her students. When she had high school students, I watched her write recommendation letters because a white teacher wrote them a letter and it was only half a page. And it simply said, they're a great student, good luck. And I watched her stay up until midnight and rewrite letters so that students could get into college. I watched her on weekends take students to college visits. Um, I watched her bring in clothes and go shopping for students who didn't have appropriate attire for their interviews and ensure that they had a shirt and a tie or a dress to wear to their interview for a scholarship, or that they had transportation to visit their college on college weekend. And so for me, education goes far beyond just the title of teaching students. It's through living a life of service. And my work in AATF is embodied within that. And so as an organization, our mission specifically is to work with aspiring college students and to see them from the moment that they say, I think I wanna teach, to the point where they are now three to five years in the teaching profession. Mm. And a lot of people talk about AATF and the work that we do specifically in providing financial scholarships. So we offer up to $5,000 a year. We offer mentoring and we offer professional development. But what I often emphasize, which I think can be relevant to our conversation here today, is that we create a family of fellows. And on August 12th, when August 12th happened, I remember being in a group text message with 10 to 15 other fellows and sharing dialogue in that moment and fellows saying, I'm so thankful I have this space. I'm so thankful that I have you all. School starts in two weeks and I have to walk into a classroom where nobody looks like me. How am I going to do that? Or I walked into my school meeting this week and my principal acted like nothing happened and everybody's giving me high fives and I don't know how I'm supposed to effectively teach 100 middle school students in two days when I'm just supposed to go through this professional development and smile and suck it up. 
and knowing that AETF has provided that space for them and provided an environment where they essentially get their cups filled so they can go out into the community and fill the cups of others, that embodies the work that we do. It's not about the money. It's not about the fact that yes, they have master's degrees. Yes, they get these certifications. The work we do changes the lives of children because we change the lives of teachers. Teaching is a very draining profession. Most people quit within the first three years. They enter into the profession and by year three, they are done. Most of our fellows are still teachers with five years plus. And I can say that that is solely because of the family we create and the community that we have. They know that regardless of what goes on in that classroom, regardless of how uncomfortable that conversation was in the teacher's lounge that they weren't meant to hear, um, regardless of that parent that walked into the building and said, oh, you must be the janitor. Can you please show me where my child's classroom is? Mm -hmm. Regardless of what that feels like, they know that they can bring that conversation back to us and we can be that safe space for them. And so my work in the community and sharing our mission and sharing what we do is fueled by them. It's fueled by the fact that currently now they're all teaching virtually and doing it with a heart for not just the teaching profession, but a heart for these kids. They love what they do. And because of that, we are able to change this community one child at a time. Mm. So thank you. Thanks so much, Tamara. Wow, you guys really inspire me. Uh, so the last person I asked to join us is Harold Foley. Um, and Carolyn, if you have Harold's photo from the wall, that would be great to put up. Um, Harold is a community organizer with the Legal Aid Justice Center's Civil Rights and Racial Justice Program. And it's okay if you don't. Um, so Sorry. That's okay. It's, it's, <laughs> I, we, we'll see him in person in two, se two seconds. So um, I'll just let uh, Harold take it away. Hey, um, I want to thank you all for um, having me. Um, Lisa, you are amazing. All the women on here are amazing and doing amazing things to fight racial justice. I really appreciate it. Um, so a little about me. Um, I, I am born and raised in Charlottesville. So I've seen the um, devastation of how people um, that look like me um, get arrested, got arrested, um, been beat up by police, um, been harassed by police. Um, me, myself, um, uh, I, in, in the early 90s, I got in trouble and, you know, I spent some time in prison. Um, I think that gave me the motivation to get out to say that, you know what, let me, help prevent as many people I can from not being incarcerated. Um, let me help as many people I can to um, stay out of the court systems, right? Um, but as I realized, it's deeper than that um, because um, our laws um, are racially um, created to lock people up. Um, the Constitution in Virginia was created to make sure that um, African Americans didn't have a chance to vote or have a chance to be able to hold office or do anything that's, you know, politically motivated, right? Um, and so let me first say that um, what I do at Legal Aid, um, Legal Aid is a, an organization that works on stopping out racial justice in um, the criminal justice system, in the housing systems, and in immigration. Um, but the most important thing is um, I also am part of the People's Coalition. And the People's Coalition has been working on keeping um, Charlottesville police accountable, right? And so um, this, it was a great fit for me um, because what I realized going, even when I, you know, I was um, with Virginia Organizing, if I know Virginia Organizing for um, 11 years, I still had that um, that that sense of the criminal justice system is awful, right? You know, the one thing that I um, did the best was help people get their rights back to vote. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, help fight for those folks to be able to, you know, give um, reasons why they want to be part of this political system. 
Um, and it was so surprising to me, because like I said, once I found out their history on how um, Black folks in Virginia um, didn't um, had a chance to get their rights because of what, it, what have been put in the Constitution, um, that made me realize that it's bigger than me just trying to help people. I got to make sure we get a whole group of people organized, right? And so our, one of the things that um, I think um, is so important is m knowing and educating yourself about what is wrong in the systems. Um, I think this pandemic has exposed so much that's like the criminal justice system is faulty. The prison system is faulty. Uh, food insecurity is faulty, right? Um, Health care is faulty, right? My thing I, I tell folks is we can't forget this moment that we are in because we so often forget every time when something major happened that, oh, okay, that was six months ago. Um, I want people to continue to fight. Like if you on here, continue to fight for racial justice, continue to fight for food justice, continue to fight for education, continue to fight for um, housing, continue to fight for the things that is um, uh, needed for folks who, who don't have the voice or have the means to fight for. Because um, so often people who are in those fights, they give up because they, they're using their time and they're not getting paid for it, right? Um, and, and that's so horrible sometimes because I wish that we could pay everybody to fight for racial justice and the things that we need to fight for. Because so often is the people who look like me don't have the means to do it because they're working a low race job. You know, they don't have health care. So they are so in a bind that they don't know which way to go. Um, I think the work that I do is so important. Um, not saying that no, no one on this um, panel work is less important, but one of the things that we're working on is, um, you know, creating a civilian re review board. We, we've been pushing that for two years. Um, you know, what I tell people is, you know, once they get involved with helping with it, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, because we got to keep fighting a long race, because what, what happens is, um, <laughs> The powers of be will give you some crumbs and say, "Hey, this is good for you all. This, you, this is where y'all should be because we don't, we don't have to give you anything else, right? You know, rubber stamp, uh, civilian re review board because it's, you know, it's it's okay because we did what we had to do. And what we found out is that community people, community folks, we got to continue fighting, right? We got to fight to the morning, to the night, to to make sure that um, we are holding." Um, not only the police accountable, but city council accountable, right? Or the board of supervisors accountable. And so, so often folks um, mix through that as being mean to me. But one thing I, I had a conversation with a friend, it doesn't matter if my, my brother is the mayor or vice mayor or this, you know, um, the senator or whatever. If I have to hold them accountable, I'm gonna hold them accountable. That's our job. We have to make sure that people are not doing things just to be saying, hey, I'm doing this. And it doesn't matter if you black or white. To me, if you're not doing the right thing, you're not doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, a nutshell about a little bit what I do. Um, and like I said, um, you can ask questions about more um, I think it's going to be a Q&A in a, in a second or so. Thank you so much, Harold. Um, you guys can see why I admire these three leaders so much. I mean, they could be doing anything. They could be making tons of money. And yet they've, in the case of Harold, has stayed. And both Tamara and Chantel have come to Charlottesville and have made this their home. And they're helping uh, they're helping the community instead of going off and making tons of money somewhere they're help they're here and they're helping and they're working really hard to make life better for all of us um, so at this point I just wanted to open it up for questions um, Enid if you I haven't really been monitoring the chat so if you 
don't, we don't really have any questions yet, but I do have okay. a statement. And that statement is number one, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, You're welcome. Putting together a wonderful panel. I really appreciate it. It couldn't have been better. Um, having your three guests is a bonus. It's good to see Tamara. I haven't seen her in a long time. Good to see Chantel. And it's always good to see Harold. Um, and maybe if you could hear the clapping that's going on right now, I would assure you that there's a lot of clapping going on. <laughs> and for those of you who are clapping, maybe you might consider making a donation to the, these three organizations that these three young people represent. So you can yeah. think about that. Yeah. Um, but I'm looking to see if we have any questions and we don't seem to have any. I was, I was gonna ask um, Tamara and Chantel and Harold to tell the folks how they can get involved with the work that they're doing. Um, certainly donations are always welcome. All three of them work for nonprofits um, and there might be other ways um, that people can plug into food justice or education or the criminal justice work. Um, so I guess... Um, okay, well, just before we do that, because yeah. I think that's important, um, there is someone who would like to, well, I, I, I wouldn't even like to think about this, who wants to know what do you think would have happened if peaceful counter protesters had not been there when we took Johnny Reb down? If peaceful counter protesters... Had not been there when Johnny Reb came down? Um, what do you actually, what do you I actually didn't see any protesters. Um, Chantel, did you? You were there on Saturday. I wasn't, I wasn't there, but this is something that someone is asking. Um, actually, Enid, if I can just interject, I think it was mm -hmm. that um, about uh, August. When oh, it was, oh, it was about, it's about August 17th, yes. August of 2017. Oh, so, it, Mm -hmm. If those of us who had decided to um, to be out in the streets hadn't, if no, if everyone had stayed home, I think they they would have had the run of the city, and mm -hmm. would have had the opportunity to spread their um, hateful message. Um, so, you know, I felt I felt like we had we had to be there. We had to somebody had to say no. This is wrong. You can't you can't come here and um, spread these, this hate. Um, so, you know, but the, un the you know, what, what I have learned though, is that, um, you know, those people that were here on August 12th, um, some of whom were from our community, some from outside, um, you know, they're, they're what I would call bigots. They have, um, you know, they have a view that, that many of us don't share and what I would call un-American. But the thing is, to make changes, we can't just get rid of them. We can't just all of a sudden say, oh, well, if they, if they just decided to love each other or love us and we all joined hands, things would be better. It won't because even if, even if all of those people that came and um, were here on August 12th disappeared or moved right. to another planet, we would still have the entrenched racism that affects our, uh, all of our citizens. Yeah. Um, it, it wouldn't go away because it's baked in. Um, so it's not just a question of, you know, changing some people's minds. Um, it's really a question of getting down to the hard policy issues. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely you, right. Yeah. But you know, my concern about that has always been that you really cannot legislate hearts. It's, you can't. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult task. So all we can do is come together like we're doing now and try to learn each other and do the best we can to get down, you know, underneath the, I don't, I don't think that the underpinnings of this country are ever going to go away personally. And I say that as a, a Black person who's been around a long time many years. I don't think that will ever go away, especially not in my lifetime. But I think that I am so pleased. I'm so warmed by what I see happening. The, the, the strides that we're making, the little inroads that we're making, I'm very, very warmed by that. Um, 
Linda Dukes is saying we can legislate policy even if we can't change everyone's hearts. <laughs> She's right about that. Yeah. And so can I can I jump in real quick? Um, yeah. So one thing that I want to talk about too is um, we came when I say we the People's Coalition City Council came into a roadblock because the CRB that we created didn't have discipline power or subpoena power to have officers stand in charges of misconduct. So what we did, we went to the General Assembly and today um, the Senate passed a bill that would allow that to go to the House. So they, they created this bill in special session um, to give localities subpoena power and give uh, localities this as well. And so let me back up a little bit. One of, one of, the reason why we couldn't get it is because Virginia is a Dillon state, Dillon rule state. So that means anything that is created in localities had to be approved in the General Assembly first before localities can approve it. And today was a big victory for um, us in making sure that we have accountability for police officers in um, Virginia. Oh, that's great news. Thanks for sharing that. that. But yeah, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Chantel, do you want to tell us a little bit, little bit about how p folks can get involved in the food justice net, um, work? Yeah, and I just um, posted in the chat, just so folks have the website. Um, there are a lot of different ways to get involved. Yeah, um, so I'm not going to belabor every single opportunity, but the easiest thing may be for folks to sign up for the newsletter. Um, and specifically with the stuff that work has, uh, the, the work that Cultivate has been doing, um, we've, we, the, so the Food Justice Network is heavily engaged in local and state advocacy work. Uh, locally, a lot of our pushes are around the city comprehensive plan um, and advocating for food justice or, or uh, chapter, which has been pretty successful. And a lot of that is really up to a, many separate voices, chiming in, giving feedback, on the comprehensive plan. Uh, we're also about to engage in strategic planning process for the city. Um, and so if folks are really interested in those types of legislative advocacy opportunities, both locally and with the state, there's a lot of uh, different things around there. And then we've also been heavily engaged with responding to COVID in this pandemic. And um, yeah, tell about your wraparound services. Yeah, the <laughs> wraparound services uh, the Food Justice Network, you know, we're a coalition of about 30 organizations and um, many of us are emergency food relief, food access orgs, and we've been able to utilize that coalition base to directly respond to folks that become sick with COVID. Um, and we're, we're actually in the process of scaling that up to the entire health district. And we've been working with Thomas Jefferson Health District, the city of Charlottesville, uh, the County of Albemarle and UVA Health. So that's on top of the, the advocacy that we do. That's been a, a, definitely a heavy lift um, on our team and in our staff, both financially and just time. In time. Yeah. And, you know, other things is stepping in to provide for CCS when there's gaps in meal delivery. And Lisa has actually been involved with helping us to coordinate a lot of those um, support mechanisms and it takes money. So we're definitely, if there's, if it's something as small as getting a donation, um, if folks are more than that, want to engage in advocacy or things like that, we're all open. Um, the gardens are actually kind of closed at this moment. So there's not as many opportunities to engage in direct growing, unfortunately, because of COVID. Uh, so, so I apologize for that. Usually we have a lot of just robust community engagement in that aspect as well. Right. Hopefully okay. that'll come back. Mm -hmm. Tamara? So of course, as Chantel said, um, donations are always appreciated. I always say that AATF is a little bit, we're such a tiny organization. Um, so it's me and one other person who typically work directly with our fellows in terms of creating the programming. Um, and then we have an awesome admin assistant in as well. But the three of us essentially are kind of like powering this work behind making sure fellows have what they need. Um, one of the things that people may not think about or reflect on often is our fellows go directly into local schools. 
So anytime that there is a school board meeting, um, I am on it. I am in attendance there because I always remind people that we can do all we can to bring the best and brightest. But when we send them into toxic environments, it makes it sets us up for failure and it sets them up for failure. Um, mm -hmm. So we can find the most amazing African-American teacher to come in and change lives. But if the principal says, actually, I think you belong in this role. I'm not interested in promoting you. You should stay over here. We're not really looking to support your growth, which has happened multiple times. Um, when we look at that, we're looking at a much bigger issue. And so we've all heard about the New York Times article that was done about Charlottesville City Schools. Albemarle County is not much different. And so a lot of what I have now channeled a lot of my energy to is the policy work around what our schools are looking like. What are the working conditions for teachers? What are teachers being asked to do? Um, just like most people, when school shut down in March, our inbox was flooded with fellows going, I have to teach virtually, help me figure, I don't have any guidance, I don't have any support. What am I supposed to do? Can you please give me something? My parents need me to show up and I don't know what to do. So as of now, a lot of our efforts are really supporting fellows and filling in those gaps. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that those school divisions typically provide professional development, one of the things that they do not provide is direct support for sustainability in the, in the profession. And so we have tailored a lot of our programming over the past year for mental health and wellness and support for Black educators. Mm -hmm. So processing a lot of the triggers that happen when you're the only person of color in your building, navigating really difficult situations if you're cornered by white faculty members and um, you're not sure how to approach that. Um, if your parents are kind of rallying against you because you know we've heard everything from like, you're too young to be my child's teacher to can I please see your degree to mm -hmm. you know just confirm that you actually have a master's degree or a bachelor's degree. All of these things have happened. And so for us, our work now has even shifted from the professional because they're they're smart. They can teach. The hard part is how do I actually teach when I'm carrying this heavy weight every single day? And so we're really putting most of our effort towards making sure that they have the mental, emotional and social support to show up every day for their families. Um, and so I encourage you all in your spare time, um, listen to what's going on in the schools be aware of what's going on and raise questions. When hiring is presented and there are no teachers of colors that were hired, when they present their demographics and you're not seeing any changes in that, as a civilian in this community, push back and ask questions about that. When the turnover rate is continuously growing, those are all things that I think are, are looked over a lot of times. Um, hiring rates like, oh, we just hired 100 teachers is often praised. But people aren't necessarily asking, well, did you lose 100? Because we might want to have a talk about that. So I always say that even if you can't donate, simply holding school systems accountable is, is super supportive to the work we do and encouraging to make sure that our work is not in vain and that we can be successful. I'm so grateful for you supporting um, <laughs> as African-American teachers, because it's, it's not an easy place to live. Um, and if they don't have the support, the social support, as well as educational, um, professional support, you're going to lose, you're going to lose um, your teachers to yeah. other places that have a better environment. So. That's been one of the struggles of African-American teaching fellows over the years, Lisa, is um, providing enough of a, of a, outlet for them to want to stay in Charlottesville. There isn't, you know, there isn't much for the black teacher. So I hope all of you listen very carefully to Tamara and support our black teachers wherever and however you can. Is there anyone else that uh, I don't know? Harold, you, you talked a little bit about what folks can do just holding officials accountable. Is there anything else you want to say about how people can get involved? Obviously they can donate to Legal Aid Justice Center doing incredible work on all fronts. Um, but any other ideas about how folks can get involved? Harold, oh, sorry. Harold put a bit of information in the chat, so. Oh, he did, okay. I would, look, I would put everyone's direction on that so you can see it. Okay. Go ahead, Harold, I'm sorry. So yeah, so um, like I said, um, I work for an amazing organization. 
Um, but in, even with our organization, we have some struggles um, getting, um, uh, you know, black folks involved, Latino folks involved. Um, and when I'm, I'm talking about like not clients, but how we can get more staff members that look black and brown. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's, and it's not, it's not, um, legal aid is definitely is doing their job. But uh, what we find out, you know, what I found out because I thought, hey, you know, we, we was looking for, you know, um, my director of the Civil Rights and Racial Justice Program, African American woman, she left. And, um, you know, I went to my, um, I went to my executive director and I said, hey, we should be able to find a black lawyer somewhere. And she's like, no, she's like black lawyers are so far in between. And when they do get out of school, they go somewhere so they can pay their bills, their um, their um, educational bills off, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh? And she said, yes. She says, out of all the black lawyers in the United States, it might be 16 to 15% um, lawyers that are black. And most of those lawyers are not gonna come work for us because they don't make enough money to pay their, uh, you know, their, their school work, school stuff off. Yeah. And it was a shock yeah. to me because I, I was like, wait a minute, what? what? But um, I think the, the theme I've been hearing all night is accountability, right? We mm -hmm. must keep folks accountable. And that's what the People's Coalition does. Um, the People's Coalition, you know, what we do is we don't need to meet. We meet to make sure we get something done, that meeting, to prepare for whatever. For instance, um, the city in Alamo County did this. Um, they paid this consultant group to do something called the Disproportionate Authority Contact. And what we call the DMC report. Um, the, DMC, the DMC report is going to, um, Monday, City Council is going to have some recommendations for, um, from the DMC report. Sorry about that. Can folks okay. hear me? Your voice, yeah, your voice okay. is kind of breaking. Um, and so, and so, so, um, so what we doing, what the People's Coalition has done is um, we created these recommendations that we want the city to take on. And so um, Monday, they're going to uh, have some recommendations that the People's Coalition has, has folded some of the recommendations from the consultant group and the People's Coalition. And so okay. what we do is we have a group of people, we have folks in, our, um, in the People's Coalition who does everything that we can get possibly done, research, um, mm -hmm. graphic design. And what we do is we just ask people to bring to the table their expertise so we can make sure we hold in uh, city council accountable, or we hold in the um, general assembly um, folks accountable. Right. Not so much Almar County yet because Almar County um, Board of Supervisors don't get it um, when it comes to police accountability, when it comes to black issues. Um, and so that's a challenge for us. And we want, we're trying to find folks who can help us because what I believe is I don't want to be the person talking about things that need to be done. We need folks who live in their localities to push for accountability. Because mm -hmm. I can't go a city resident and push Almar County for accountability. I need I need folks to help me push them for accountability. Mm -hmm. Well, I think everybody heard your message, Cheryl. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so Unless we have other questions, Enid, maybe we will wrap up. Wrap up because we want you to take an opportunity to fill out the survey, which is very, very brief. Okay. But don't leave before you do that. Okay. Um, unless uh, Tamara or Chantel or Harold have anything else to else? offer or any other questions from the audience, I guess we can do this. I, I do want to say thank y'all so much. I appreciate everyone who's taking their time out to come to hear us. Um, you know, people could have been doing something else, being outside in this beautiful weather. So thank y'all so much for um, ha I'm taking your time. You guys have Thank been you. fabulous. Now there's one other thing. Next Wednesday, oh. I expect to see all of you next Wednesday at 5.30.
Dr. Beverly Adams will present microaggressions. Why do they matter? So I hope to see you all then, but please, we thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been wonderful. We had a very nice group of people here. It started out at 99, but we're dropping down to 69. So <laughs> fill, out, fill out that survey that's in progress and we'll see you all soon. Thanks a lot.